It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Davenport. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Um, to the Premier. On this side of the House, we know there's power in a union. Last week, the government belatedly learned that too, when they were forced to make a major retreat on the use of the notwithstanding clause in a bill that not only banned strikes, but outrageously imposed a contract on our very lowest paid education workers. My question this morning is very simple. Will the Premier vow today to never again use the notwithstanding clause in a labour dispute? The Minister of Education. Member opposite for the question. All along, Speaker, we have advocated for children to be in stable classrooms. We know that the threat of strikes, pandemics, have a great deal of impact on children's mental, physical, and social emotional health and their academic success, Speaker. That's why we are at the table today and we will remain at the table, designed to get a deal that is fair for our workers, that preserves the in-person learning experience that our children deserve, Speaker. The plan to catch up as announced was premised on a belief that kids have to be in school. $650 million more million are allocated this year compared to last year. Nearly 7,000 more staff are hired Order. since we came to power. Almost 1,000 more frontline teachers. A 420 per cent increase in mental health. All of this is because we are committed to publicly funded schools. We're committed to getting a deal and keeping these kids in school, Speaker. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, that's very rich coming from a minister whose threats have led to some of the greatest disruption I think we've seen in, in, in decades. Right the use of the notwithstanding clause, and I'm going to go back to the Premier on this, was an unprecedented failure of your government. Mm -hmm. This was completely avoidable, but it seems like you were getting some pretty bad advice, Premier. A few weeks ago, the Premier's campaign manager, Corey Tanaik, said this about possible future labour disruptions at our schools. He said, and I'm going to quote, you're going to get legislated Order. back, including the use of the notwithstanding clause, and you can take that to the bank because it's going to happen. <laughs> After last week's debacle, I think we all hope that this Premier has learned a thing or two. I ask again, will the Premier stand here today? and vow never again to use the notwithstanding clause to shut down the charter rights of Ontario workers. I am the member to make the comment to the chair. To apply for the government, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we're going to stay at the table to get a deal that keeps kids in the classroom. That is our commitment. It's what we're guided by. It's what the people of Ontario sent us here to do. We are committed to ensuring stability for children. I would urge the members opposite to consider the very real impacts of union-driven strikes on children. They are real. They have learning loss, mental, physical health impacts that we can quantify. Order. And these are not abstractions. These are the children of our province. They have an obligation to them. We have an obligation to them, which is why we're increasing funding in publicly funded schools, increasing Order. staffing, over $3 billion more than when the Liberals were in power in 2017 7,000 more staff when compared to when we started, 1,000 more frontline teachers. We are committed to our children, and we're committed to keeping kids in school, Speaker. The final supplementary. I can tell you we're not going to take advice from a government whose actions shut down our schools. Yeah. Speaker, the Premier's use of the notwithstanding clause to take away bargaining rights did not just target CUPE education workers, it put the bargaining rights of all workers at risk. Yeah. Whether you're a union member in a school, a factory, or on a construction site, the Premier's actions sent a clear message. Your rights end when he no longer feels like recognizing them. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to ask the Minister of Labour this time, what did he do to stand up for the rights of workers that he claims to work for? And will he at least commit to never voting for this again? Speaker, we are standing up for the rights of children to be in school Order. so they can stay in a stable classroom where they belong. We know these kids deserve Order. to be in the classroom with more funding and more staffing and more opportunities for them to get ahead. It has been an extraordinary time in this province. This is not a normative period. Kids have member for a global come pandemic to order. caused learning loss in every region of the Western world to the member from Davenport who seems to believe we are an island of ourselves. We are part of a global challenge, but we have a plan in this 
province designed to help these kids get back on track. $650 million more, a specific tutoring program, the first and only of its kind in the country. Number for Davenport, come to order. Helping 100,000 kids today get ahead. That's how we help support them, get them back on track. But, Speaker, it all starts with keeping them in the classroom in the first place. Next question, the Leader of His Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, to the Premier. For months, for months, healthcare professionals have raised concerns about hospitals' capacity to respond to early respiratory illness season that we're seeing this year. Despite the alarm bells, this government sat on their hands and did nothing. Today, ER wait times at children's hospitals are unseasonably high, pediatric ICUs are over capacity, and children are being transferred to adult hospitals. Why has the government ignored the growing crisis in Ontario's children's hospitals? Respond, Minister Hill. Here and with the greatest of respect, we haven't been ignoring it. In fact, our government has made unprecedented investments to ensure that our hospital partners have the uh, resources they need to make sure that they can deal with, which is what is uh, undoubtedly a bit of a triple threat of RSV, influenza, and COVID-19. In particular, with COVID, with the emergency departments, we have invested $90 million in ED to play, pay for result programs that provide funding incentives for 74 high-volume emergency departments to make improvements in areas such as length of stay. We've implemented 49 models of care for select 911 patients where patients can receive Order. timely and appropriate care in a setting outside of an emergency department. We funded Orange's Response. virtual medical doctor trial for northern hospitals at risk of closure. And the emergency department locum program and the COVID-19 temporary summer locum program expansion have provided supports for eligible hospitals in rural and northern Ontario to maintain 20 Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. So even with repeated warnings, it seems like the government somehow didn't see this coming. Children's surgeries are now being cancelled so that staff can be redeployed. Over the weekend, Sick Kids Pediatric ICU was at 132 per cent. McMaster Children's was at 140 per cent capacity. One pediatric ER described the situation right now as, quote, scary and, quote, unsafe. We all have a role to play in protecting children from severe illness, especially the government. Why hasn't this government responded effectively to the acute pressures on our children's hospitals and increasing demand for pediatric ICU beds? Mr. Health. So again, I would say respectfully, we have responded and we are responding with our partners. You know, the, the COVID-19, influenza and respiratory RSV are triple th threats that our hospitals and our pediatric patients in particular are dealing with. The most vulnerable, the most senior and the, the youngest in our populations are definitely a risk, which is why earlier today, Dr. Moore did, as the Chief Medical Officer of Health, strongly recommend Ontarians of all um, areas add a layer of protection when appropriate. And that includes a strong recommendation to mask when indoors, when interacting with our most vulnerable, certainly with our youngest uh, four and under who cannot uh, mask, and making sure that if and when you have the opportunity and you are uh, in, a, in a time and place that is appropriate for your timing, that you get your flu shot, which is free of charge and available across Ontario in pharmacists and at primary care. And of course, keep all of your vaccines up to date. We need to make sure that all of the tools. Thank you. Thank you very much. The final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The government has been completely ineffective. At sick kids, children going to the hospital are very sick. More than half the kids in their ICU are on ventilators. Over the weekend, the CEO of SickKids said, quote, so far none have died, thank God. Wow. Speaker, I have a really hard time understanding how this government allowed the situation to get so bad that the CEO of this province's premier children's hospital is thanking God that no kid has died. To the premier, why didn't the government act sooner effectively to avert the crisis? 
Minister of Health. You know, Speaker, last week I was at the uh, in Vancouver for the FTP. And at the federal, provincial, territorial meetings, every Minister of Health from across Canada shared with the group what they are doing to protect their citizens. They talked about vaccine rollouts. They talked about how they were protecting the most vulnerable. They talked about how they were training additional health human resources staff. And as the group went around the table and shared all of the initiatives, Order. I turned to my officials and said, what are we not doing in Ontario that others are doing and we could emulate? And the answer, sir? was nothing, because Ontario has already implemented those. Yeah. We have trained new HHR. We are training new nurses. We are giving individuals who want to practice nursing in the province of Ontario a process Fox. that is expedited through the College of Nurses in Ontario, and it is working. We have more historically now getting through the licensing process with the College of Nurses and the CPSO, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, in a faster way because we understand people who want to practice in health care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Comiskey, Ming Cochrane. Thank you, My question is to the Minister of Agriculture. Ontario is losing 320 acres a day every day of farmland to development. 320 acres of the best farmland in the world every day under the minister's watch. Farmland that we will need to feed our cities. Do you think food's expensive now? Wait, if we keep going at this rate. Now the government has announced that it also wants to pave over 7,000 of acres of farmland in our Greenbelt, including the Duffin Rouge Agriculture Preserve. Another 7,000 acres gone forever. Why is the minister so eager to pave over our food security. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I just want to thank the opposition for their, their question. Mr. Speaker, we have a housing crisis. We have a housing crisis that the majority of our kids can't afford to buy a home. They can't afford to live Order. in Toronto or GTA because the previous government didn't have the backbone to make the changes. Mr. Speaker, we're increasing the green belt more than 2,000 acres. Unlike the previous government that changed the green belt 17 times, and you voted for it for 17 times. You supported Order. them changing the green belt Order. to suit their buddies to change it 17 times. We're creating 1.5 million homes over the next 10 years, and I'd like to ask this chamber, where are we going to put the 1.5 million response? people just over the next five years that are going to show up right here in Ontario? And in Canada, 1.5 million people the next three years. We need homes. We're going to build homes, affordable homes. Yeah. I remind others to make their comments to the chair. The supplementary question. I would like to thank the Premier but for his answer, but in the response, how are we going to feed those people? And the Premier's own task force stated that it, the land isn't the problem, and we need to protect the Green Belt. So we know the land isn't the problem, but we also know the Premier made a promise to speculators a long time ago and then recanted, but obviously this is a promise he intends to keep. So now, why? Why are you continuing to allow the best farmland, the farmland that we need to feed our people? The things that are important to people are shelter, yes, but even more important, food. And we have the best land in the province, and the Minister of Agriculture sits and watches it being paved over. Why? Order. Order. The premium. You know, Mr. Speaker, last week we had great friends come here from the Royal. And when they came from the Royal, I went down there my spo myself, spoke to endless farmers. And they're extremely happy how we have their backs, we have the supports. We're going to make sure they're well taken care of. But, Mr. Speaker, again, I'd like to ask the opposition what are they going to do when 60% of the 500,000 people a year come to Canada and they arrive in Ontario? 
what are we going to do? Are we just going to stock them up in, into, into rooms? No, we're going to build them affordable Official house, opposition housing. To order. We're going to uh, build them attainable housing, something that the opposition would never, ever do. Opposition we need to, to plan for the future, not only for the new Canadians that are coming, but the next generation that they can afford. And that's the Response. reason we're building transit that extends into areas that we're building. And we're building right beside existing existing uh, developments that are right there and on the other side of the street. Mr. Speaker, if you won the lottery under the Liberals and you're a farmer, you won the lottery, 40, 50, 100 million dollars, but your next door neighbor, the exact same piece of property, guess what? He'll be struggling for the next hundred. Thank you. The next question, or official opposition, come to order. Order. Government side come to order. Next question, the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance. The ongoing global economic instability and worldwide supply chain disturbance continue to negatively impact the people of Ontario. In the face of this economic uncertainty, my constituents continue to struggle with rising costs driven by higher gas prices due to the federal carbon tax. Many of my constituents express concerns about their household budgets and the unexpected rising cost of their day-to-day -day necessities. Speaker, with all these concerns, could the minister please tell the House how our government is working to keep Ontario on a sound economic footing and providing continued financial relief for my constituents? Thank you. The Minister of Finance. Well, thank you to the hard-working member from Scarborough, Agent Court, for that question. Mr. Speaker, we are in uncertain times amid global economic uncertainty and with the cost of living increases reaching levels not seen in decades, the road ahead will not be easy. And we know that the people of Ontario are under pressure. Governments will need to be agile with a responsible plan to respond to any challenges while acknowledging the risks of inflation. That is why we have a plan that maintains flexibility and continues to invest in building the critical infrastructure and services that the people of Ontario rely on and works to restore our manufacturing capacity while keeping costs down for people and businesses. Mr. Speaker, we have a strong plan for Ontario and by being flexible and demonstrating Fox. restraint, we can overcome any challenge that comes our way. Supplementary question. Speaker, Rising expenses and continued economic uncertainty are impacting all Ontarians, including the people of my riding. We have seen news reports about people across Canada saying they are spending less on food due to escalating prices. In the recent fall economic statement, Canada's Federal Minister of Finance, Krista Freeland, said, quote, Canada cannot avoid the global slowdown, end of quote. Just recently, the Governor of Bank of Canada also warned Canadians that we should expect more interest rate hikes and that a mild recession is possible. Speaker, what is our government doing to ensure that Ontario remains a jurisdiction that is viewed as economically sound and financially robust as we negative these navigate these times of uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you again to the member from Scarborough Agent Court. Uh, Mr. Speaker, over the last couple of years, Ontario and the rest of the world faced a once-in-a-generation challenge unlike any in our, all of our lifetimes. The COVID-19 pandemic tested our resolve, but we stood together to get through those tough ties, and today we are navigating another challenge. Mr. Speaker, Ontario, like the rest of the world, is facing challenging economic times. But I am confident in our province. I am confident in the resilience of the people of Ontario, and I am confident in our plan to build Ontario. 
That is why I'm proud to be introducing our government's 2022 fall economic statement here, here. this afternoon. We have a strong plan to build infrastructure. We train workers and restore our manufacturing capacity, Mr. Speaker, while keeping costs down for the people Response. and businesses of Ontario. <laughs> Together, let's build Ontario. Here, here. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, CHEO's pediatric unit, ICU unit, hit 280% capacity. Inpatient medicine is at 171%. The emergency department, which was built to handle 150 kids, is seeing on average 229 kids a day. Surgeries are being cancelled and children are being transferred to hospitals hours away. The government can't blame seniors waiting for long-term care for causing this situation. So when will the Premier get serious about the crisis in health care, make the necessary investments, and repeal Bill 124 so our children get the health care they deserve? And to reply, the government house, no? Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question from the Honourable Member. Uh, the Member will know, as the Minister of, uh, of Health has uh, just outlined, uh, that the incredible work that the government is doing to ensure that health human resources uh, are ever present and ever increasing in the province of Ontario. That's why the, uh, the Minister of Colleges uh, and Universities has undertaken a really a, a, a nationwide leading and successful, uh, a successful uh, program to encourage. Uh, uh, more people to get into nursing. That is why, through the Ministry of Long-Term Care, we are adding nurse practitioners. Not only are we adding nurse practitioners, uh, Mr. Speaker, but we are also paying uh, for those nurse practitioners in addition to 27,000 additional PSWs across uh, uh, the long-term care sector uh, alone. And it goes on the back of uh, the uh, uh, really the nationwide leading investments that we've been making uh, with respect to health care across across the province of Ontario in, in all parts. We've increased budgets for our small and medium-sized hospitals. We're building hospitals in Brampton. We're increasing capacity uh, in, uh, in Mississauga. In all parts of the province, Mr. Speaker, we're doubling down to make sure that the people of the province of Ontario are protected. Supplementary question, member for Nickel Belt. I'm, I'm hoping, Speaker, that the Minister of Health can answer. Uh, everyone but members of this government agree that we are witnessing an undeniable and unprecedented health human resources crisis. Ontario hospitals are falling further behind. Nurses vacancies in Ontario have increased by 300 per cent since March of 2020. The government says that they've brought thousands of new nurses, but where are they? Speaker, we are currently at 14.5 per cent turnover rate among hospital nurses. It's clear that the government plan, the so-called retention bonuses, have done very little to keep workers in the field. Will the minister repeal Bill 124 and show some respect to our burnt-out health care workers? Mr. Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. Let me give you a couple of numbers. 11,700. 25,000. Over 12,000. Now, what do those numbers represent? 11,700 new health care professionals since March of 2020. 25,000 applications for nursing programs at Ontario's Order. colleges and universities. World-class education right here in Ontario. 12,000 nurses, the number that Opposition the come to order. CNO registered more nurses this year than within the uh, record-breaking number, and there's still months to go. People are flocking to the nursing profession because of the investments that this government has been making in health care and long-term care, and we'll continue to see those investments made and the opportunities Response? for students in this province. Yeah. Next question, the member for Barrie Innisfil. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation, who's getting people moving and saving them precious time. Experts and so many community members have told us time and time again the rapid growth in Simcoe County and York Region means we need to build roads, highways and bridges today for the transportation of that people need tomorrow to save them the precious time so they can spend it with their family and friends and get goods to market. But unfortunately, Order. Speaker, the 
Places like uh, in Bradford and Simcoe County have seen a stalemate of the Bradford bypass for far too, far too long when the Liberals have time and time again shot it down, eliminating the potential for more people to spend time with their families save them time to get to work and get our agricultural products to market. So I want to ask the Minister of Transportation, she talks to many people in our community, Question. why is it so important to get shovels in the ground and to finally bring the Bradford Bypass? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Barry and his bill for the question. Speaker, as the MPP for York Simcoe and as Minister of Transportation, I've heard resounding calls from business owners, from farmers, and from residents about the need to get the Bradford Bypass done. And I couldn't be more pleased, Speaker, that under the leadership of this Premier, our government is finally answering the call. Last week, I joined the Premier and local mayors in Bradford to announce that our government has finally started construction on the Bradford Bypass. <laughs> Unlike other governments that came before us, our government is actually delivering real progress on the project and fulfilling the commitment that we made to residents across York Region and Simcoe County and beyond to get critical infrastructure built. Mr. Speaker, we are getting it done. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, uh, for getting it done and really understanding the needs of our greater community. We need to build roads and bridges if we're going to build up this economy and save families time and also embrace our agricultural sector. She, like myself, often talked to Jody Moat, the executive director of the Holland Marsh Growers Association, and she said, quote, Speaker, this is an essential piece of infrastructure that farmers require to ship our produce that feeds 55 per cent of Ontarian speaker. So not only is it important to them, but we know that gridlock is worsening and we need real-time solutions to get it done. So I want to ask the minister if she could elaborate on the great benefits of the Bradford Bypass and what it means to surrounding communities. Minister of Transportation. Thank the member for the question. The benefits of the Bradford Bypass go far beyond just providing relief from congestion. In addition to helping our farmers get their goods to market faster, the project is also attracting new business and creating jobs across the growing communities in York Region and Simcoe County. Just a few weeks ago, I was pleased to be in Bradford to celebrate the groundbreaking of Toremont Industries' new remanufacturing facility. Once complete, the facility will create nearly 200 new skilled trade jobs for members in the community. And Speaker, this is only just the beginning. Our government is continuing to build Ontario to help boost our economy and create jobs for people in every corner of this province. Thank you. The next question, the member for St. Catherine. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Niagara is in a unique position because our city councils are still meeting, and so your housing bill has been met with considerable concern. St. Catherine City Council voted unanimously, stating that there is nothing in this bill that advances more homes to be built faster or more affordable. Hmm. There are some big questions around slashing development charges, like who is paying for them? It appears to be a transfer of profits to the development industries at the expense of the community. Premier, have you read the report from St. Catharines? And will you guarantee that municipal taxpayers will not be left on the hook for downloaded costs when you slash municipal revenue like development charges? I remember to make the comments to the chair, not to across the floor of the House. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to reply. Uh, thanks, Speaker. You know, when, when I listen to that question, it just again rings true the desire by some municipalities to delay the reason for change. You know, we have a generation. There's a generation in St. Catharines Order. that don't realize the dream of home ownership. And delaying the decision is going to make things worse. We need to be sure that we get shovels in the ground faster. And you know, it's quite interesting that the member talks about development charges. When, when I see that the region of Niagara has $206 million wow. in their DC wow. uh, reserve fund. Wow. Speaker, we know there's Order. a severe problem. So we, need, we know we have to build 1.5 million homes next year. And in fact, as the member of St. Catharines come to order, 
with the amount of new Come Canadians on. we're going to be welcoming to Ontario, we need to step that up even more. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Not only is the City of St. Catharines concerned with Bill 23, so is the Niagara Regional Council. Niagara Regional Council sent, a, sent the minister a letter outlining how problematic Bill 23 is. They say it will have significant financial impacts and will result in fewer affordable housing units. Mm -hmm. The government plans to pave over the Greenbelt, as well as put municipalities under serious financial strain yeah. just to help their developer friends make millions of dollars. Order. Under Bill 23, we will lose 7,000 acres of prime farmland. Some of it is the best in the world. We must protect our food security. So my question is clear to the Premier. Has the Premier consulted with the municipalities question. affected by this bill, and will you meaningfully address the concerns of Niagara? Members to make their comments. Through the chair, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And another question, uh, you know, I know that nimbyism, not in my backyard, is, is really strong in, in Ontario. But you know, Order. I used a phrase after we tabled Bill 23, the, the fact that we've now transcended from nimbyism to banana. Build absolutely nothing anywhere, anywhere near, near anyone. Anything. You know, we consulted mayors. The Premier and I had, had a meeting in January with big city mayors and regional chairs. You know, and the NDP can deny this all they want, but clearly there are, are factual studies that show that municipal fees add an average of $116,900 to the cost of a home in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. So if the NDP want to stand up with high Order. fees and high housing costs, okay. they can do it, Speaker. They can do it all they want. We're going to stand up House for building more supply, providing affordable opportunities. We want to make sure that that young family can realize the dream of home ownership. Well done, Minister. Order. Both sides of the House will come to order. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Okay, my question is for the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, the number of people who face urgent housing situation in my riding has reached new peaks. I have both landlords and tenants reaching for help to resolve their issues. However, the only help I'm able to provide is to refer these constituents to the Landlord and Tenant Board. The problem is that these housing disputes are by nature urgent and pressing, which makes the long delays at the board a crisis for families in Ottawa Valley. People have to wait months for a hearing, and when they do get one, it is a short summary affair with little time to find a just outcome. It is clear that the experiment of completely virtual hearing is not working for landlords, and it's not working for tenants either. So my question is, will the Attorney General commit to reopening in-person hearing sites across the province so that we can have a hybrid system that provides landlords and tenants with access to justice in a timely manner? Response? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I'm pleased to address some of the investments we made in the Landlord and Tenant Board, and I can tell you, after no investments by the previous government, uh -oh. after no effort, we are picking up the pieces, Mr. Speaker, and they were supported by the NDP before that, Mr. Speaker. They did nothing but watch the system crumble. But our government has invested. Yep. We have invested $28 million in a state-of-the-art system that is up and running and receiving applications in the tens of thousands, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud to stand on, on the fact that we've appointed more adjudicators than the history of the board. Mr. Speaker, we put four and a half million dollars into Order. speeding up the process, Mr. Speaker. So it's unfortunate that what they left to go fallow has resulted in us having to pick up the pieces, Mr. Speaker. But we will do it. We will get the job done. Get the job done. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, there's clearly not enough resources allocated to address the backlog because the crisis is still very much there. Mr. Speaker, 
a landlord contacted me that she has not received her rent payment from the tenants for six months because they refused to leave the property due to this non-payment. The landlord has not been able to pay her own housing and her and her daughter are being chased out of their own homes. This has affected so many families and so many people in Ontario, especially in terms of the way that these audiences are organized. Many of them want to have in-person audiences. Does the minister has a plan to reduce those backlogs and respond to the problem? One of the most important pieces about the Landlord-Tenant Board is that it's independent and that it does fair fair and effective hearings, Mr. Speaker, and so that is happening. We have more adjudicators than, than the history of the board, hearing matters, moving them along, making sure that they're fair and independent and that both sides get heard, Mr. Speaker. We're, we're also putting resources into making sure that the system helps people navigate. There's a new navigation tool that is being accessed in the, in the tens of thousands, and the online system that we, we adopted and changed for Ontario's use that was created by the NDP government of BC, Mr. Speaker. We are working collaboratively, collaboratively with all partners to make sure that we're getting the hearings done, that they're independent, and that fair and just results are, are the, uh, the outcome. outcome. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Markham Cornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skill Development. Great, Minister. Ontario is at a critical juncture. We must welcome more immigrants into our province to meet our ongoing and our future economic needs. We have seen reports from all sectors of the economy warning about the low number of immigration welcome into Ontario and its adverse impact on our economy. For example, nearly 75% of businesses in the farming industry say they are suffering because of the current labor shortage. Mr. Speaker, with the release of the federal government full economic statement, can the minister please tell us what effect this will have on how Ontario address our immigration and skill rate deficit? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member uh, from Markham Thornhill for this very important question. Speaker, welcoming more immigrants is critical to Ontario and Canada's economic success, and we need the federal government to make a real commitment to working with us. For our province and for our country to succeed, Ottawa must dramatically increase the number of skilled newcomers who come to Ontario and give us more of a say. Speaker, our government is leading the way in Canada in recognizing foreign credentials and breaking down other barriers that newcomers face. We need the federal government to join us at the table today. And question. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. Mr. Speaker, the number of job vacancies in our province continue to increase monthly. Many view of Ontario as a favorable jurisdiction because of our untold economic opportunity and potential. As Ontario and Canada face economic challenges driven by global uncertainty, all governments must work together to address this issue. I understand that in Ontario, we can process immigration nominee application in as little as 90 days, while the federal government requires up to 46 months for the approval process. Because of this unnecessary extended time frame, Ontario and Canada continue to lose billions in economic productivity, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain Question. what action our government is taking to address this important issue? Thank you. Mr. Blader. Well, I want to thank the member again for that question. Speaker, Ontario continues to urge the federal government to work with its provincial partners to expand programs that help fill labour gaps through immigration. I speak regularly with Minister Sean Fraser, Canada's Minister of Immigration, and I'm hopeful we'll be able to find common ground and make tangible progress on these issues. At minimum, we expect the federal government to double the number of immigrants Ontario can select, and we are ready to offer them our processing capacity. It is critical that Ottawa address the ongoing application backlogs and approve applications more quickly so workers who want to come to Ontario can arrive and enter the labour market without unnecessary delays. 
Speaker, my message to the federal government is simple. Let's work together and build a stronger Ontario and a stronger Canada. Thank you. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. The physician shortage in Northern Ontario small town hospitals is facing a crisis. With three of six physician positions soon to be vacant in Wawa, the hospital there is desperate for assistance from this government to help to prevent closures and staff burnout. We've already seen ERs and primary care affected across the region in the north. What is this government doing to ensure that small northern hospitals will not have to close their doors to patients? Minister of Health. No. I, I have to ask, because the member opposite has been in this chamber for many, many years, where were you when the Auditor General talked about the fact that Northern Ontario was facing a physician shortage in their Auditor General report when the Liberal Party was in power? Where were you? Are you willing to stand and, and agree that increasing Order. The number of physician positions available in Northern Ontario, in rural and remote communities across Canada, is the appropriate thing to do for us. Where were you when the Liberal government was cutting those, those spots in, in Northern Ontario? We have made the investments. We will continue to make the investments. We have a Northern Medical School that is expanding the number of residency positions. We are expanding. Thank you. I'll remind members to make their comments to the chair, not directly across the floor. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The Wawa Hospital has been getting by on agreements with this government to ensure locum coverage. But, at the, but on August 31st, the funding for that agreement was cut unilaterally with, no, unilaterally with no notice to the hospital. When concerns about keeping the doors open were expressed to the Ministry of Health officials, the ministry suggested, well, why don't you just divert your primary care support to your emergency support? Speaker, this is a recipe for disaster. Without primary care, you're setting up the system for failure. Will this government work with Northern health care providers to recruit and retain doctors in the North? Mr. Health. A recipe for disaster is when the Auditor General, 10 plus years ago, highlighted the need for additional doctors in the North and across Ontario, and it was ignored. We are making those investments now. We will continue to make those investments. We are doing it with investments in peer-to-peer -peer programs. We are making it with investments in air or orange ambulance to ensure that northern and remote hospitals make sure that they have coverage in their emergency department. We will continue to make those changes. We will continue to work with our hospital corporations, and we will make sure that in the future, we do not deal with health human resources that were as a result of governments ignoring a pending surge in population and a need to make those investments. Here, here. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question, my question, Mr. Speaker, is for the Minister of Energy. Under our government's watch, we have seen a return of the manufacturing sector and an overall improvement in our economic productivity. But this success has led to questions about the strength of Ontario's energy grid and the ability to produce the electricity we will require for the future. Our government recently announced plans to continue the operation of the Pickering Nuclear Generation Station through September 2026. My constituents in Durham know, Mr. Speaker, that the Pickering plant serves a significant function in Ontario's energy grid. Speaker, could the minister therefore elaborate on the Pickering nuclear plant's role Gen in supporting Ontario's energy operations? Minister of Energy. Well, thanks to the member from Durham for the great question this morning. I want to start off by recognizing the amazing job that Ontario's nuclear workers are doing every day to keep the lights on in Pickering, at Burlington, and also at Bruce Power. Pickering provides Ontario with a source of low-cost and reliable zero-emissions electricity every day to meet the province's baseload energy needs, not like 
the intermittent wind and solar projects that were brought on, 33,000 of them by the previous government. Our nuclear fleet, our world-class facilities, they're providing power that's available when we need it every day of the week, Mr. Speaker. And at the same time, by supporting the safe continued operation of the Pickering Nuclear Generating Station, Mr. Speaker, we are standing shoulder to shoulder with those Response. workers in the Durham region, those good-paying jobs, those hard-working people that are providing the clean power that Ontario needs for the future. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I also share our government's appreciation for the dedication and diligence of the workers of the Pickering nuclear plant. Maintaining the Pickering nuclear generation station will protect good-paying jobs for thousands of workers in Durham region and across Ontario. About 7,500 jobs across Ontario are related to the Pickering nuclear generating station. These jobs represent skilled workers who are the backbone of our economy, and they help to provide the clean, reliable, and safe power that Ontarians rely upon. Unfortunately, not everyone in this legislature, Mr. Speaker, shares that view about the workers in my riding and the benefits their labour and sacrifice provide for this province. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please reaffirm his support for the workers of the Pickering Nuclear Station? Minister. Thanks, Speaker. It's a, it's a great follow-up question from the member from Durham. I don't know why anyone in this legislature would oppose this move that is clearly a win not only for electricity generation in the province and future growth in our province, but it's also a win for the environment. Earlier this morning, in estimates we heard from the member from Kingston, who seems to be opposed to nuclear energy, Mr. Oh. Speaker. We heard from the member opposite, who's now the leader of Government the NDP, Mr. Order. Speaker, oh. who seems to be opposed to nuclear energy. Oh that source of electricity provides 60 per cent of our electricity every day. It's a zero emission source of electricity, one that is the only pathway to get us to net zero in our province, Mr. Speaker. The member, the leader of the NDP in this House, Mr. Speaker, on dozens of occasions has spoke about the lack of support for nuclear in our province, Mr. Speaker. We're standing firmly with the people of Pickering, the people in, Dur in Darlington, the people in Bruce that are providing low-cost, reliable and affordable electricity. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. McMaster Children's Hospital in Hamilton has reached a crisis point where occupancy has reached over 140 per cent. I'm not confident that the Premier or his minister understand the severity of this situation. Children are critically ill. Parents are terrified. Healthcare professionals are calling for action. McMaster is ringing the alarm bells. What is the Premier going to do to ensure hospitals have the resources and the capacities to provide hospital care to our children? Thank you, Speaker, and I will reiterate what uh, Dr. Kieran Moore mentioned earlier today, which was our most vulnerable, our, our youngest population, people with underlying health conditions, need to be protected, which is why earlier today, Dr. Kieran Moore made the recommendation strongly to mask while in public indoor settings. We are taking these actions because we understand there is a, per a percentage of the population who cannot have a vaccine. Having said that, we have done incredibly well in the province of Ontario to have access and make sure that people who have the ability to have that vaccine, get their flu shot, keep the up to date on their vaccines and their boosters because we know that it does make a difference. We know that it keeps Response. our youngest and most vulnerable out of our emergency departments. We know that by doing the right thing, testing, staying home when we're sick, we can make a difference and we can take the pressure off those most vulnerable people in our population. I would hope that the member. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, what the minister is talking about is what the community needs to do to support the hospital. I'm asking what the government is going to do to support the hospital. 
empty words and gestures are not good enough. The Premier has offered no aid to McMaster, even though wait times have spiked to 12-plus hours just over this past weekend. His government is sitting on $2.1 billion of budget surplus dollars, and they're not spending it. Will the Premier commit today to spending surplus dollars to support McMaster's Hospital and our pediatric care crisis? Minister of Health. Speaker, the members' words do not match our actions. You know, we have invested $90 million in emergency department pay-for-result programs, which provide funding incentives for 74 emergency departments in high-volume EDs to make improvements improving, including length of stay. We've implemented 49 models of care to make sure that people who call 911, if they so desire and have the ability to do so, can get their care in other places in community. We funded Orange's virtual care medical doctor trial for Northern Ontario at risk of closure. And yes, Speaker, we have assisted McMaster and all of the other children's hospitals across Ontario because we know that they are experiencing some incredibly challenging times with influenza, with RSV, and with COVID-19. We will continue to work with our funding partners to make sure that they have the investments, but we also have a collective responsibility to make sure individually we do the right thing and keep our youngest people safe. Thank you. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, investing in post-secondary students is critical to building a highly skilled workforce here in Ontario. For our economy to grow and become an economic leader once again, we must support our students in obtaining the relevant experience they need to get good jobs after graduation. And when I talked to the good people at Etobicoke Lakeshore, all those employers said, we need people. With the tens of thousands of well-paying, highly skilled jobs going unfulfilled in our province, we must act now to connect students and businesses to these new skills and opportunities for advancement. Speaker, could the Minister of Colleges and University update this House on how our government supports students in practical, work-integrated learning? Minister of Colleges and University. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, the Member from Etobicoke Lakeshore, for that important and timely question. And I say timely because just last week I was excited to announce that our government is providing over $10 million to help MyTax, an organization that builds research partnerships between post-secondary institutions and industry to create 2,700 paid internships for post-secondary students. Speaker, we are so pleased to be supporting post-secondary students and partners through experiential learning programs like MyTax that prepare students with skills and training needed for jobs in an innovative economy. And they will not only help prepare students for the workforce through on-the-job learning, but will also help to remove the stress of worrying about financial compensation. Even further, Speaker, these internships allow employers to connect with emerging leaders in the field, nurture talent, and develop their industry. Investing in skills training opportunities Fox. for students and recent graduates is part of our government's plan to work for workers, supporting Ontario's economic growth for positioning students and st businesses for success. Here, here, here. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for that update. And I also want to thank the minister for taking an interest in our local college, Humber College, and visiting there with me early last year. So thank you for that. You know, while I, I'm encouraged to hear that our government is supporting our next generation of workers in this new economy, we need to be confident that all Ontario students will be able to participate. Many students require more selection and learning opportunities to accommodate their unique circumstances and needs. Speaker, can the minister elaborate on what our government is doing to support these innovative partnerships and increase flexibility for student learning opportunities across the Ontario's post-secondary landscape? Great question. Minister. Member for that question. Speaker, since 2018, our government has investing in our post-secondary sector to be more responsive, flexible, and reflective of the changing nature of work. It is investments and innovative solutions that will allow the single mother in Northern Ontario to attend short-term classes between her work schedule. It will allow the young learner with accessibility concerns to go to class online when they physically can't get to class. 
We have made tremendous strides towards connecting students to work online or in person, part-time and full-time, uh, across disciplines across Ontario. Speaker, in the last five years, Ontario has spent over $57 million to support MyTax to create over 14,000 research internships, and over the next 10 years, we will be investing $500 million to Response. support research opportunities across Ontario. We will continue to invest in training our post-secondary students to prepare for the jobs of tomorrow, because when students succeed, Ontario succeeds. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, this Premier and this government know that health care is in crisis. Can you imagine going into the emergency room and hearing the pleas of a patient in that emergency room asking, when am I going to see a doctor? The pain is so horrific. Please, can I see a doctor? When will someone be able to help me? That's what we're hearing in emergency room, Speaker. In London, London Health Sciences has reported a 20-hour wait time in emergency rooms. And now, Speaker, reports are coming from across the province that there's a dire shortage of ambulance services, mm -hmm. of ambulances available. Just last week, I heard from constituents who had two incidences where they called the ambulance services last month and they had to wait for hours to arrive to help his wife who had fallen and couldn't get up. Question. They had to cancel one of the calls, Speaker, because a repairman arrived and were able to help. My question is, what is this government doing to ensure that people have emergency care services when they need them? Minister of Health. Speaker, we are building capacity and we will continue to build capacity. As the member opposite knows, ambulance and paramedic services are funded 50-50 between the municipality and the province of Ontario. Not once, Speaker. Not once have we ever turned down a municipality who wants to expand their ambulance capacity. We are offering and expanding the number of ambulance paramedics that are training in the province of Ontario through investments in colleges and universities. We are building a health human resources that will be second to none in Canada. We will do that. We are doing it through the College of Nurses and, and the Physici College of Physicians and Surgeons. We are doing it through our health system, through retention pay. We are doing it through an expansion of our human resources training in colleges with, our, with the assistance of our partners. And we will continue to do that work because we understand that as Ontario's population grows, we need to make sure that we have the jobs and the resources available for those people who need it. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Middlesex London paramedics, paramedics are sounding the sirens, and paramedics have already proposed a pilot program that would help triage ambulance demands to take the pressure off the system. The pilot has already been endorsed by Middlesex County Council. When will the Premier and the Minister of Health respond to the proposal and help fix the problem in London and across the province so people have access to ambulance services when they need them the most? Minister of Health. Speaker, I cannot reinforce how pleased I am to hear the member opposite talk about and encouraging innovation in our health care system. The number of innovative ideas that have come particularly through the paramedic system include, of course, the 911 model of care, which allows individuals to get treated outside of an emergency department. That idea, that idea, Speaker, came from paramedics, came from chiefs who understood we have trained healthcare professionals who can do more and are willing to do more. We'll continue to acknowledge, accept and review those uh, innovative ideas and approve them when appropriate. But again, I, I cannot underlie how pleased I am to hear the members opposite Finally, talking about embracing innovation in our health care system. Well, Thank you, Speaker. The next question. Member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is for our great Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. Thank 
you. Ontario's older residents and people with disabilities deserve more inclusive opportunities to stay fit, active, healthily, healthy, and socially connected in their communities. I have heard from residents across all of Northern Ontario about the accessibility issues they face when they are out and about. They face challenges that many of us have not ever considered, Mr. Speaker. Our government must continue demonstrating leadership by ensuring that Ontario is open and inclusive. Speaker, can the minister please tell us what our government is doing to ensure that people with disabilities in Northern Ontario can fully participate in our great province? Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Speaker, thank you to the member for asking such an important question. The member from Susan Marie is doing a marvelous job representing Northern Ontario. It was my pleasure to announce $32,500 in funding as a part of an inclusive community grants initiative at Blind River Town Council last week. The people of Blind River are top notch. They care and want to make their town as accessible as possible. I want to congratulate Mayor Sally Hagman and the entire council Response. for their leadership in making the town as a shining example of how any community across Ontario can become more inclusive. Thank you. Thank you. A supplementary. Uh, we're out of time. <laughs> You're good. Oh. Thank you, Speaker. Oh, it's on. Sorry. I, I didn't know the mic was on there. My apologies, Mr. Speaker. I know that the funding received by the people of Blind River was of particular importance to them as it aligns with their broader economic and social development strategy of a barrier-free community. Northern and rural communities were neglected for far too long under the previous Liberal government when it came to addressing these infrastructure needs. Seniors and people with disabilities experienced this neglect firsthand. Speaker, can the minister please explain to the House why the funding for Blind River and across all of Northern Ontario is so critical to our government's overall mission of being open and accessible to everyone? Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Again, for the question, the town of Blind River is showing leadership in championing when it comes to accessibility with this Seed Anywhere That Make You Smile program. They are ensuring everyone has access to everyday recreational use. Mr. Speaker, our inclusive community grants are only in Blind River, but all across Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we are investing to help ensure everyone has an equal opportunity to engage in their communities. Again, Congratulations to Mayor Hegman and all the council members of Town Blind Ribo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.